Mr. Rivali, uh, will you hold it a minute? I, I gotta find a pencil. Okay, go ahead. He was funny. He was always clowning around. He was a comedian. He was a real pioneer. He had an incredible voice. He told me that he played baseball in high school against Joe DiMaggio, who was from San Francisco. He's the first Asian-American hipster. The word got out that he was an enemy alien. I do know that he had to report to the FBI. I know his real name was Goro Suzuki. Barney Miller was a show on TV in the 70s that was about a uh, police precinct in New York City. And it was one of the first truly multi-ethnic, multi-racial shows. The star Hal Linden was Jewish and played a Jewish guy in the show. Uh, some of the other people in it were Puerto Rican, they were black, there was another Jewish actor, and then there was Jack. And I think this was a perfect melting pot type series, and Jack was one of the great things in it because of his, again, his deadpan style. No matter how animated other people are around him, or how excited they are, or how emotional the scene is, Jack is able to maintain that very cool, deadpan quality. Dietrich, in all the years that I've been in the force, I've never once been offered a bribe. Does that bother you? Well, I wouldn't take the money, but sometimes it's just nice to be asked. The thing about Barney Miller as a police station was not only the people who were on the show, the cops, but those people that came through the door. You never knew who was coming through that door. But he was, he was funny. And I tell you, when, when the lines were right, Jack was great. I mean, you know, we're always as good as our material. But, but when the lines were written the right way, you know, like fastball down the middle, Jack would hit it out of the park, you know. He, he was great. 12 Precinct, Sergeant Amana. Yes, sir. A stolen car? Uh, what kind of car, Mr. Rivoli? Studebaker. <laughs> Will you describe the car, please? Black fenders, silver doors, green hood, polka dot uh, seat covers, monkey fur dashboard. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't stolen. Maybe it ran away. The key to the show was Danny Arnold. Danny was, was all of us. He used who we were as our characters, but we were all a little piece of Danny Arnold, too. But, you know, like I said about Jack's gambling. Jack gambled, your mana gambled, you know. Enjoy it. <laughs> Buy something useless. <laughs> Blow it on the horse. Make me feel like I'm not alone. <laughs> I think one of the things that motivated Jack in the choice of roles he took was that he had been in the internment camps during World War II. And I think that that, in one sense, was also a motivating factor for him. He, in maybe some ways, had to prove that he was just as American as everyone else because of this experience that had happened to him during World War II. You know, one episode in particular where uh, uh, George Murdoch, who later played an ongoing nemesis of the squad room, but he came in as an army recruiter and he spots this Japanese guy and he's all over him with very accusing looks and trying to trying to needle him and find a place to slip in the dagger. My name is Ravel, Master Sergeant J.R. Ravel, United States Army. I recognize the uniform. <laughs> I'll bet you do. Yamana finally has had enough of him, so he puts him in his place by by letting him know that he was in the in the service and you know he had served he was an American citizen and he had served his country and kind of shut the guy up. I don't hold any grudges. I mean about the war and all, you know? I was in the army. You what? Benice Division. We landed in Italy. Benice Division. <laughs> On our side. Four Forty Second, United States Army. Benice Division.
I know Dad volunteered for the military. We have the, we have the papers that show that he did. This is a letter from the uh, headquarters, Military Intelligence Service Language School, uh, Office of the Commandant, May 1944, to Mr. Goro Suzuki. Your name has been recommended to us as qualified for further training in the Japanese language preparatory to combat intelligence duty. Dad had volunteered for the Army, and I guess they felt this is where he could best serve. This thing need batteries, Nick? Why do you ask me? <laughs> Made in Japan. <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't. Jack was never afraid of his ethnicity, and in some ways he made it a fuel for his comedy. And I think in this sense, what that means, he was one of the first anti-PC comedians. I'm ruining my eyes reading with this flashlight. You know, they do look sort of funny. You shouldn't squint. <laughs> this isn't a squint. This is a squint. Jack was one of the first Americanized uh, Asian American uh, speaking uh, English without an accent. The coffee's a funny color. It's maroon. <laughs> How'd it get to be maroon? It's the color spectrum. You mix brown coffee with yellow water, and you got maroon. <laughs> Why is it fizzing? It's the air sneaking out of the cracks out of the cup. And it had a real following. We won the Emmy for Best Show one year, but we won the Peabody Award a whole bunch of years. So. I think it played a particular place in people who really loved the intelligence of the writing and the ensemble that we had. It wasn't just the cast, but we kind of, the whole production was an ensemble. And Jack was one of the reasons for that. I think that's one of the things that Jack liked about the show, why he wanted to be on the show, and why he played so well on the show, that he was just one of the guys. And that's what the show was about. We're all in it together. We're black, we're Jewish, we're Italian, we're Asian, and we're just a bunch of guys here in a New York precinct trying to fight crime. What you gotta do is develop an oriental philosophy. Like my grandfather used to say, many things look bleak at the moment of occurrence, but at least we ain't got locusts.